a massive earthquake rocks the Pacific Northwest. Buildings shake, roads crack open, and the power goes out. But the real horror hasn't even begun. Within 15 minutes, a wall of water 700 miles wide is rushing toward the coast, moving faster than you can imagine. Why 700 miles wide? That's the extension of the Cascadia subduction zone, the fault line that could unleash the biggest tragedy in North American history. Yeah, this isn't a movie or some distant hypothetical. It's the terrifying reality of what experts predict could happen to areas like Washington, Oregon, and Canada's Vancouver Island if a mega tsunami strikes. But even when they're not gigantic, tsunamis are some of the deadliest natural disasters on Earth. Not only can they reach insane heights, they also surge inland with relentless force, carrying debris, leveling structures, and sweeping up everything in their path. They cause drowning and destruction, while also leaving disease in their wake. And the aftermath? Often, it's a shattered landscape and shattered lives. So how do you survive something as powerful as a tsunami? What should you do if you're caught in its path? Today, we'll dive into real stories from tsunami survivors and use their experiences to help you prepare. What's the world record for the highest tsunami wave? How fast can a tsunami travel? And which US state is at the highest risk of facing a tsunami? We'll get to that in a second. For now, hit that subscribe button to stay on top of the deadliest disasters. To understand how to survive a tsunami, we first need to know what we're dealing with. The word tsunami is Japanese, meaning harbor wave. And that name is fitting. These giant waves form in open water, often due to underwater earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, or devastating landslides. When the ocean floor shifts, it displaces water above it, creating waves that travel across the sea with immense energy, only to slow and grow in height as they near the shore. Tsunamis are deceptive. In deep water, they can move at speeds up to 500 miles per hour. That's as fast as a commercial jet. Except, unlike regular waves, which lose energy quickly, tsunamis maintain their force across entire oceans. When they finally reach land, they rise into monstrous walls of water that can flood miles inland. History has shown us just how powerful and deadly these waves can be. Take the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami, also known as the Boxing Day Tsunami. Triggered by a 9.1 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Sumatra, it generated waves as high as 100 feet, devastating Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and India. Over 230,000 people lost their lives. And then there was Japan's 2011 tsunami, which followed a colossal earthquake. It resulted in 18,000 deaths and led to a nuclear disaster in Fukushima. Among this tragedy, though, are stories of survival, bravery, and the human instinct to endure against all odds. We'll learn what it takes to survive these terrifying walls of water. And it won't matter if you're a strong swimmer or not. The Boxing Day tsunami of 2004 was one of the deadliest in history. When the earthquake struck off the coast of Sumatra, it unleashed a powerful wave that traveled across the Indian Ocean. Many who survived did so thanks not only to quick thinking, but also sheer luck. Maria Bilan was vacationing with her family in Thailand when her life changed forever. She described hearing an unearthly roar just before the tsunami struck. Within seconds, she was swept up by a torrent of water separated from her family. She was submerged for long periods, repeatedly slammed against debris with absolutely no control over her body or her surroundings. This led to life-threatening injuries, including a punctured chest and deep wounds in her leg. After resurfacing and battling against exhaustion, Maria miraculously spotted her eldest son, Lucas, trying desperately to keep afloat. The two managed to climb a tree to escape the floodwaters and waited for rescue. They were eventually found by locals and taken to a nearby hospital. There, Maria was reunited with her husband and two younger sons, who had also miraculously survived the tsunami. If this story sounds familiar, it's because it inspired the 2012 film The Impossible, in which Naomi Watts portrayed Maria. Her story shows the importance of finding something, anything, 
stable to cling to if you're caught in the water, and to not give up even when everything seems lost. Also, if you hear a loud roaring sound coming from the ocean, like Maria did, it's time to get to high ground as quickly as possible. This is by far the deadliest tsunami to hit Indonesia with over 170,000 casualties. But it wouldn't be the last one. In September 2018, a 7.5 magnitude earthquake struck Palu, Indonesia's largest city of the central Sulawesi province. It triggered a tsunami and a terrifying phenomenon known as liquefaction, where soil mixes with water, creating a sea of mud that swallows everything in its path. Mulis Ipul was home with his wife and two young daughters, aged seven and five, when the earthquake struck. The shaking was so violent that the asphalt split apart beneath his feet as he and his family ran out of their house. Before they could escape, the earth opened up. Mulis fell into the cracks, losing hold of his five-year-old daughter. His wife and children were swept away in the mud as he lay trapped beneath the broken asphalt. The ground churned and twisted, burying Mulis in mud. He heard the desperate screams of others nearby, but couldn't move. Potobo, a group of villages home to 7,000 people, was obliterated. Suddenly, the mud beneath him exploded upward, freeing him. He grabbed onto a cable and let the rushing mud carry him to safety. Eventually, he found himself on top of a small hill, injured, but alive. He waited there, hoping to hear the cries of his family, but he would never see them again. There's a key piece of information that is relevant to this tragedy. Potoba was scattered across reclaimed swampland, making it vulnerable to liquefaction. For countries where cities are overpopulated, sometimes building on unsteady land is done out of necessity and not by choice. But if you have the chance, research geological risks before settling in any area, especially in earthquake-prone regions. Another takeaway is to hold on to sturdy or buoyant objects in mudslides or flood situations to keep yourself above ground. The destruction of Potobo was made by waves about 18 feet tall. This goes to show that a tsunami doesn't have to be gigantic to cause tremendous damage. Now, if you're wondering about the biggest wave created by a tsunami, it happened in Latuya Bay, Alaska in 1958. This rockfall tsunami hit a world record height of 1,720 feet. Bigger doesn't always mean deadlier though. Let's bring it back to one that is still fresh in our memories. The 2011 tsunami mentioned earlier in this episode that struck Japan was catastrophic, with waves reaching up to 133 feet in some areas. It destroyed entire towns and caused three nuclear reactors to release radiation into the environment. On March 11, 2011, Akiko Iwasaki, a 54-year-old innkeeper, was going about her day in the coastal town of Kamaishi, Japan. At 2.46 p.m., the ground shook violently beneath her as a 9.1 magnitude earthquake struck. Like many others, Akiko understood an unspoken warning, a tsunami would follow. She instantly went to get her mother and daughter, who were on the second floor of a house next to her small hotel. Akiko alerted her guests and took them to the parking lot outside. Knowing the risks of staying too close to the coastline, she hurried toward higher ground. She made it to a safe zone up the mountain with a small group. Then, she realized there were still many people in the parking lot. She remembered her grandmother's words, those who go back, never come back again. But at this point, her big heart and desire to help people were stronger than her common sense. She headed back with some of the hotel staff and convinced more people to climb up the mountain. That's when she noticed the water level was rising sooner than anticipated. She started running back to the mountain. When she thought she was reaching the safe zone, Akiko was swept off her feet as the growing wave overtook her. She found herself looking at the blue sky for a moment, then everything turned black. Debris swirled around her, turning the water into a deadly mixture of sharp objects, vehicles, and mud. In the chaos, Akiko desperately tried to grab onto anything she could find to stay afloat. When she reached out of the water, a woman from the hotel staff grabbed her hand. Fearing her potential rescuer's arm might break, Akiko let her go and ended up next to the hotel bus. The water went calm and they rushed to climb on top of the bus before another wave came. They managed to jump from the roof of the bus to the mountain and climb to safety. Akiko's awareness of her location and emergency protocol were determining factors in their survival. 
She knew where to go because of regular drills, and immediately headed for higher ground with others. If more people were aware of the danger of staying in the parking lot, she wouldn't have had to go back to save them. Luckily, it all worked out for her. Organized evacuations save lives. If you can, help others reach safety as well. Survivors were resilient in all the events we saw today, even when everything seemed lost. Each tsunami is different, but the lessons learned from them are often the same. Whether you are in Japan, Indonesia, or the United States, preparation and quick acting are key. In the US, Hawaii has the highest risk of being hit by a tsunami, followed by Alaska and the West Coast. But if you live in a coastal area, no matter the country, you should always be informed about emergency and evacuation plans. That's also true if you live near a dam, where a landslide could generate crushing waves that can obliterate a town in seconds. By now, you might be thinking, it's 2025, there must be some technological advances to help us save lives in these situations. Well, there are, and they're getting better every year. Take Tsunometers, for example. That's a great name, by the way. These devices are stationed deep on the ocean floor and are able to detect even the slightest changes in water pressure caused by undersea earthquakes or landslides. Once a potential tsunami is detected, tsunometers send critical data to monitoring centers via satellite. This early warning system is a game changer, providing coastal communities with precious minutes or even hours to evacuate to safety before the waves strike. But what if you don't have enough time to get to higher ground? That's where tsunami survival capsules come in. Yeah, remember the Dragon Ball capsules? The same company actually built them. These futuristic, portable shelters are built to withstand the crushing force of tsunami waves and the debris they carry. They offer a secure option for those unable to evacuate in time, and you could get them for up to 10 people. The cheapest one is around $15,000, so you might want to start saving. Another futuristic way to prepare ourselves to face tsunamis is through virtual reality simulators. These cutting-edge training tools immerse people in realistic tsunami scenarios, teaching them how to react in real time. VR helps people build muscle memory and quick thinking, which are necessary to survive under pressure. It can also be customized to help you choose the fastest evacuation routes and identify safe locations. What stands out even more than all these advancements is the survivors we witnessed today who made it out alive through sheer strength of will and determination, minus any of this futuristic assistance. Would you be able to face these mammoth phenomena and make it out alive? First, you'll need to understand the true scale of these waves. Check out our video comparing the biggest tsunamis in history, right here on How to Survive.